Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. In this episode we'll be looking at the sinking of the American oil tanker the USS Neosho during the Battle of the Coral Sea. But before we get started, if you've not already done so, have a look at the website www.podcast.com. There you'll find news, updates and things I've dug up that are World War II related. Recently, I've been scanning in a photo album that I own of an unidentified German soldier. The album starts with him in the Hitler Youth, next he's conscripted into the Labour Corps before he joins the Wehrmacht. Looking at those pictures, I think he's probably in France. There are some photos of French colonial prisoners of war uh, before I believe he was transferred to fight on the Eastern Front. Anyway, they're on the website. If you have any insight, I would love to hear from you. Joining me today is Don Keith. Don is an author with a prestigious body of work, both fiction and non-fiction. His latest book, The Ship That Wouldn't Sink, A World War II Story of Courage and Survival at Sea, is a fantastic read, focusing on the events surrounding the USS Neosho and her crew when it came under attack by Japanese pilots. Don, thank you for joining me. What first drew you to the story of the of the Neosho? How did you, how did you hear about it? Well, I always look for stories that are about average people placed into unusual situations who do remarkable things. And I've done a number of books on uh, World War II submarines. I did a book about the USS Nautilus and the the journey under the North Pole in 1958. And I was actually looking for the next story when my literary agent asked me if I'd ever considered writing about the Neosho. Well, my first question was, well, what Japanese uh, vessel was that? And he said, no, it's, it was an American vessel at the Battle of the Coral Sea. And it's, as, I, as he described it, he didn't really know a lot about it, but he'd always heard that it was a remarkable story. And uh, that sent me off doing research. And it took me one day to realize it was a great story of tenacity and human spirit and uh, the will to survive, how sometimes we do the wrong thing at the right time or the right thing at the wrong time when uh, in dire situations. And this is a perfect example of both those. It is. And, and so, so, so should you, what, what was the Neosho? What, what was its uh, uniqueness? The Neosho was, uh, of course, an oiler, a tanker, a blue-collar ship. She's extremely valuable because uh, not only did all the vessels in the Allied fleet run on uh, fuel oil, but so did all the airplanes on the aircraft carriers in the Allied fleet. So Task Force 17, which was in the Coral Sea in May of 1942, uh, the Japanese suspected they were there but didn't know for sure. And at that particular time, the Japanese were uh, getting uh, together to launch an attack on Port Moresby in New Guinea. And it would have been uh, a, a very key tactical win for them to do that because that would set them up to eventually uh, invade Australia. But it would certainly allow uh, Japanese to to have a lot better access to the shipping lanes to and from Australia and to the airfields in Australia that were running uh, nightly sorties over Japanese-held territory in New Guinea and some other places. So the uh, Allied fleet was there in the Coral Sea prepared to attack the Japanese fleet and that would be the Battle of the Coral Sea. The uh, task force commander was extremely cautious about keeping his, uh, his vessels and airplanes topped off with fuel, but when the impending battle was uh, out there, he ordered Neosho to go about 200 miles south under the escort of a destroyer, the USS Sims, and she was to wait there. If any vessel in the fleet needed refueling, they had uh, a couple of rendezvous points that they could both run to and, and do that. But the aim was to keep the Neosho out of harm's way. Well, as I mentioned, the Japanese were dimly aware that the Allied fleet was likely in the Coral Sea, but they had not seen anything. They had no signs of it, but they certainly were getting uh, information that they were there. And they had scout planes in the air looking for the fleet. And one of those scout planes with a young pilot spotted the Neosho. And in the haze and the mist and the excitement of maybe uh, pleasing uh, the Admiral, he mistook the Neosho for one of our aircraft carriers. The Japanese immediately sent over half their complement of aircraft to sink that supposed aircraft carrier. 
At the same time that was happening, the uh, Allied fleet had launched planes and were stopping the invasion force that was headed for Port Moresby, turned them around, and for the first time in the war, stopped a Japanese invasion. The um, Neosho was attacked by more than 80 aircraft. The um, escort vessel, the USS Sims, was sunk within 20 minutes. I mean, did, how, how did they manage to present? I mean, it, you've got 80 planes attacking two ships. They really didn't have much defense, did they? Right. Although the destroyer was obviously much more heavily defended than the uh, the oiler was. The oilers had a very limited complement of guns. But for her size, the Neosho was able to maintain exceptional speed and was very maneuverable. So she was ducking and dodging just as uh, the destroyer was and firing away at the, uh, the uh, attacking aircraft. The Sims took a direct hit. Uh, a couple of direct hits and was was sinking very quickly. The Neosho managed to uh, last through three waves before she was mortally damaged. She was on fire. She was listing 30 degrees. And the uh, Japanese by that point were well aware that they were not attacking an aircraft carrier. And uh, they left the scene assuming that uh, the uh, oiler would follow her escort destroyer to the bottom of the Coral Sea. But the remarkable story to me, first, is how she managed to even stay afloat as long as she did under attack. And secondly, how that crew worked together, knowing the ship would inevitably sink, trying to keep her afloat, trying to keep spirits up, trying to doctor uh, a number of wounded uh, crew members uh, and wait for rescue to come. There's, there's two points that... that i thought were interesting I, the, the 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 fog of war that you bring out in the book uh, over the whole attack um I, I thought was very interesting the confusion it's not just confusion it's the confusion afterwards no one uh really knew quite what went on exactly and i think that's that happens in in wars throughout history and continues to happen in battles today it's ironic that we study tactics and we plot all these things out in a classroom and yet once we get into war we are so dependent sometimes on very, very minor mistakes or, or minor bits of heroism that can completely change the course of a battle, which can change the course of a war. In this case, during the, the, the battle itself, the captain ordered the radio officer to send their coordinates to check with the navigator and make sure where they were, just in case the worst happened, a rescue ship could find them much more quickly. Well, as sometimes happens, the, the, the navigator had made an incorrect plot entry and the radio officer did send that incorrect location. And that would lead to it being four days before a rescue ship would show up. That's part of the tragedy of war. Seven direct hits and, and a plane crashed on its decks. So this was a, a, a battered and bruised ship with a, compl with a complement of, was it nearly 300 people? Exactly. Uh, close to 300 men on in the crew, plus 15 survivors who managed to get off the Sims before she went down. The rest of the Sims crew, uh, which would be close to 245 men or so, uh, died on the Sims. But there were a couple of other mistakes that happened during this thing. Dur during the course of the attack, uh, the captain, John Phillips, who did a remarkable job of holding this crew together, sent the order to his uh, officer of the deck to prepare to abandon ship but remain at general quarters. Well, by the time the that word was relayed by word of mouth, some of the crew members only heard abandon ship. So almost 200 men jumped overboard into shark-infested waters, water on fire from the oil that was leaking from the tanker, and the life rafts had already been thrown overboard. Every one that was usable had been thrown overboard empty. So those men either drowned in the water, were eaten by sharks, or close to 100 found their way into uh, those life rafts. These are the, and I had to look these up, because Carly rafts, is that what they're called? Yes, Carly life rafts, which was actually invented in Australia. They uh, float very well. These particular rafts on this particular kind of ship did not carry any sort of rations or any sorts of tools or anything that could be a help because it was assumed if the ship went down, rescue would come relatively quickly. Unlike aircraft where only a very small crew goes down, they generally have uh, rations stored in the, the raft as well as fishing gear and 
uh, tarpaulins to use for shelter and that sort of thing. And, and unhelpfully, I believe they were painted gray, weren't they? Yep, they were painted gray uh, because they actually hung on the bulkheads of the above decks on the ships. So you didn't want anything brightly colored there to, to help people see the ship in uh, limited sight situations. It's not always helpful when you're at sea hoping to be picked up and rescued. When your life raft is the same color as the water in which you float, it's very difficult to be spotted. We have a hundred souls adrift afloat and we have uh, around another hundred or so on the crippled tanker. Yep, counting the, the crew of the Neo Show and the 15 men who came over from the Sims who managed to get one lifeboat in the water and some passengers. Uh, they actually had five passengers aboard that were being transported. They were going to take them back to Pearl Harbor uh, and when they went back to refill the, the tanks on the, the oiler. Uh, so... Uh, the, the rough guess, and probably fairly accurate, is there were 125 men aboard the Neosho as she began sinking. But she didn't sink. That first afternoon, they managed to keep her afloat. They did a number of things to keep her afloat, but there was always in the back of their minds the realization that they would eventually sink. Now, understand they're 500 miles away from the nearest land. But they also were confident that the, the fleet had heard the, the message about the, the attack and that they were in dire straits and that a rescue vessel was already on the way. Of course, they also had no idea of knowing what was happening with the, uh, the battle itself. They didn't even know for sure if the fleet was still there, if maybe the, the fleet had been wiped out by the Japanese. And understand also their radio at this point was almost non-functioning. They kept sending messages. They were transmitting as best they could with very much reduced power but they couldn't hear anything and they had no way of knowing if anybody could hear their signal. They have a, 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 a cold and dreary night on the ship and indeed there was a ship was sent out to look for them, not that they were aware, aware of it, yes. but couldn't find them. The, the first message about them being under attack and uh, that they had suffered severe damage was received and a, a battleship, the USS Monaghan, was dispatched to go to the point where they had last been reported. As it turns out, that point was 64 miles off from where they actually were and uh, they misjudged the drift too so they had actually drifted uh, almost 100 miles farther away so they were nowhere near where monahan was looking for them 60 miles is a huge it, it, and understand that the men who were on the life rafts they actually lost sight of the Neosho the first day because they were drifting at a different speed than uh, the mothership was uh, during the night they pulled some of the rafts together, as many as they could get together, and they counted 58 men on those rafts. They lashed them together, and they, too, were in fairly good spirits because they had survived. They actually f were afraid that their shipmates back on the Neo Show were, had, had far worse luck than they because uh, the ship was sinking, and they had all the life rafts out in the water. Uh, so spirits were pretty good that first night, although a number of them were, were wounded. Uh, but by the next day, as the sun rose, they realized they had nothing to eat. They had no water to drink. They had drifted so far away they could no longer even see the smoke from the ship. So either she had sunk or they had drifted uh, a considerable distance. Then they started worrying about what was going to happen. There's the uh, four-day rule. If you have no food, no water, and no shelter, especially in uh, that latitude, you can only expect to live for about four days. It must be absolutely terrifying. No, I mean, presumably they know that, and uh, just sit, sitting there with, with nothing. Yeah, there's no kit there to help yourself either. Nothing they could do about it. They they didn't even have a paddle. They they had a few paddles, but not certainly not enough to row a, a life raft that was overcrowded anyway. Presumably, there's no way of them even to catch catch rainwater if it fell particularly or no no implements to even rig, jerry rig a fishing hook and line not that it they might you know doesn't guarantee success exactly and we, we've seen examples of people who have survived for longer than a month um while drifting at sea but they had fishing line they had uh, some supplies to start with they had some way of getting out of the sun with no help well they had help the very first night some of them did because a corpsman 
actually swam from life raft to life raft, treating the burns as best he could. That was the, the, he felt those were the most serious injuries and would lead to infection, even if they, even when they were still assuming they would be rescued shortly. Uh, that would be the biggest problem when they got back to a, a hospital was infection from the burns. He, an extremely brave young man because he was swimming in the dark from raft to raft and we don't know what happened to him. But he was never picked up. Nope, he was never rescued. That's, it shivers down your spine, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, yeah, you know, back to the, the ship, the Neosho, she continues to list. The deck plates are buckling. Obviously, the superstructure is succumbing to the, the pressures of the sea. Uh, she continues to take on water. Um, they're trying to salvage at, at least another uh, whale boat, uh, lifeboat, that they can put into the water because the plan is if they're not rescued shortly, they're going to have to get everybody on the, the ship, 125 men, into two lifeboats, some makeshift rafts they were going to put together just from anything that would float from the, the ship, and they were going to try to make a run for the uh, northeast coast of Australia, uh, still 500 miles away. I wonder what the likelihood if they'd made the run that they'd have made that would have not, been. Not very good. Not very good at all. But that was the only choice if the ship went down. But she was resilient. That's the title of the book, The Ship That Wouldn't Die. Uh, it, they did were able to do some things to keep her afloat. They tried to uh, drop the anchor, which became hung, to uh, lessen the, the list and maybe keep them from drifting so far from uh, the reported position. Um, they were not able to do that. They finally had to work very hard to cut it loose to keep it from making the ship list even more. But they would continue to go below decks and bring up what stores they could, what medicine they could, blankets, that sort of thing. Most of the men remained on the deck, uh, especially the wounded, because they wanted to be able to get them into lifeboats as quickly as they could should the ship suddenly decide to either explode or, or, or sink, which could happen at any moment. Understand that she was still carrying quite a bit of fuel oil, which has fumes, which are highly explosive. And why they didn't explode during the, the bombing attack is still a mystery, a miracle, if, if you will. Yes, that, and I, I presume it was comp the whole ship must be compartmentalized, which probably helps it save her. So you get a hole in one part, it holds it back and, and slows the process. That plus at least, at least one bomb actually went through the deck, uh, through the tank and out the bottom of the deck, and that's where some of the leakage was was coming from, uh, without exploding. There's plenty of ships suffered from kamikaze attacks with, with just one plane hitting them. You know, she was hit with seven bombs, a direct hit, uh, uh, with a plane crashing into her. That I mean, it, it's incredible that she stayed afloat. Uh, presumably, as well, she had steel decks. So I think some of the kamikaze planes would set fire to the all, uh, wooden decks. So I mean, it's, it's very resilient. So these guys are sat on the deck. The decks beating sun, but at least they have uh, food and water. Yep, uh, as much as they could get. Now, I don't know how much longer they would have still had food and water because a, a lot of the uh, uh, below decks was flooded. Uh, a lot of it was covered with oil. The steam lines had been ruptured, and I guess we should have mentioned way back that uh, she was without power because during the attack, the steam lines were ruptured, so she had no way of, uh, of moving. And she was totally adrift this entire time. Uh, but yeah, the, the parties would still go below decks and bring up what food they could. We, One of the uh, crew members later told his family members that he would never eat canned peaches again because that's all they had for th the last three days. Or mostly all they had were canned peaches. They just happened to be what they were able to get to. <laughs> Presumably the Japanese realized that they'd not found the ace in the hole. And didn't didn't come back to bother them. So the next plane they saw was a friendly face. Actually, they they realized that when the the, the attack force showed up, uh, they radioed back uh, that this was not a carrier at all. But they were almost 250 miles away from the fleet, and they were given the orders to go ahead and sink it. It was a, an oiler, so it had some value. And of course, obviously, the battleship did too. You're there already. Sink them. By the time they would get back to the carriers and refuel, it would be dark, and they wouldn't be able to go to the assistance of the uh, the Port Moresby attack force anyway. So it was too late for that. So they took uh, they took it out on the poor Neosho. So they were adrift for 
what, four days, I think, before they were eventually spotted. Right. And they, they were helped tremendously. Another, uh, the uh, Monaghan had to leave after the first day. She could not find any sign. And you, they certainly assumed there would be a huge oil slick when a tanker went down. There would be, uh, if not debris. Um, so she had to return because the Battle of the Coral Sea was raging at that point. In the meantime, the Henley had been sent from another base, a land base farther to the east. The Henley, another destroyer, showed up in the general area, and they too were getting frustrated on the very last day that they were going to remain on station looking for the Neosho and the Sims. A PBY aircraft, which is very well suited for aircraft rescue. And there's still a lot of question, why didn't the PBY see them and the rafts sooner? Uh, the Coral Sea is not a huge sea, but it's still a huge body of water. A, a, a tremendous territory to be uh, uh, looking for something in. At the same time, remember that the Japanese have just taken a big blow at the Battle of the Coral Sea. And yet the primary tax, task force, uh, the two big Japanese carriers, are still there and they're still looking for the Americans, the American fleet. So it was very dangerous to be in that area. But uh, the Henley did stay on station. She managed to get within 50 miles. But even then, she was on the verge of turning and going back to base. Had not the PBY aircraft come along and agreed to go help look, they did find an oil slick and debris. And we assume that was mostly from the Sims and from the uh, what what oil had leaked from the Neosho. The PBY, within 20 minutes, located the hulk of Neosho, and she was uh, her crew was rescued. It's incredible. You'd have thought the slick must have been you know tens and tens of miles long. You would have thought from the air it would have been an easy find. Wouldn't yes, you? but uh, the sea was rough. It broke up a lot of the slick. A lot of it burned anyway. Um, and it's just a, a, a lot of water to search in. Um, so they, they were lucky. They were picked up after four days. On the whole, they were walking wounded, and they were not too bad. Right. Um, but if they had not been found within the next two hours, they were going to abandon ship, take to those lifeboats and those makeshift rafts, and, and, and uh, leave. So they would have found a, an empty hulk, a ghost ship, if they had shown up two hours later. And what had caused Captain Phillips to decide, come, come, come with that decision? The ship was really, as far as he could tell, was on the verge of sinking. And if it sank in a hurry, they simply would not be able to get the men into the, the boats quick enough. And a lot of them would, got, would have gone down with the ship. He also had, had, by that point, learned that the wrong coordinates had been radioed four days before. And he didn't know if there was really any hope of rescue at all. So he made a hard decision that we're going to go ahead and abandon the ship at uh, 1400 this afternoon. Well, at noon, the ship, the rescue vessel showed up. A little before that, the PBY flew overhead. They'd actually been passed by an Australian plane several days before, but uh, that word was never properly relayed. So. Yeah, it just gets missed, gets missed in a piece of filing and somebody nobody quite knows what's going on. Exactly. That, that, must, that must have been a very difficult decision to make that they were going in two hours and it, they, the, re, the relief must have just... Well, there was actually speculation among the officers and they had overheard some conversation of the crew members. Some of them may have mutinied and refused to leave the ship. At least the ship was still afloat, even though it was clear she was continuing to sink. They felt they would be better off on something that big, um, would be easier spotted than just the, the two lifeboats and the makeshift rafts. Uh, so we don't know what would have happened had it actually come to that. No, and it's funny because when I was uh, reading it through, I thought, what, 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 how would I feel if I was told to abandon ship? And part, part of me thought, I think I'd have preferred to stay because at, at least it's an enormous right, it, <laughs> thing to spot where that, two little life rafts bobbing around, going in a direction where no one quite knows where you are. And that's what the rescue vessels and the aircraft are looking for is a, a big ship. Yeah. yeah. Now, the men on the rafts were not quite so fortunate. As I mentioned, close to 100 is the best estimate of how many men might have ended up on the rafts. But of the ones that were lashed together, they actually took account there were 58 survivors on those uh, rafts. And I, I don't remember the exact number of rafts. I think it was only four, so they were very crowded. But after the, the first day and a half or so, some of the men actually began to drink seawater because they were so desperate. 
they very soon started having uh, seizures and jumped in the water and began acting irrationally and that sort of thing. By the uh, sixth or seventh day, they were down to very, very few men. They still had no food. They still had no water. Even though rainfall is common and was actually one of the key things during the Battle of the Coral Sea because of the, the, the thunderstorms that uh, the Japanese carriers had hidden in, they never got the first drop of rain during the time they were on the rafts. By the time they were eventually rescued by the USS Helm, it was nine days later. There were four men still alive, and they had cut loose all the rafts, but one, the one they were on, plus one that they tried to pull on top of them, but they were too weak to actually get it there most of the time. They had agreed that when they finally saw a vessel, they never gave up hope. Even though they were too weak to even stand in the, the, um, the raft, they would take one of the men and help him get to his feet, and they would prop him up with a, a piece of paddle they still had on the, the, the uh, raft in the hopes that he would be able to wave and, and help them to spot them. The USS Helm, which had come from the same base as the Henley three days before, specifically to look for the men in the rafts, because by that time the captain of the Neosho had reported that a number of men had taken to the sea and had gotten onto rafts and would be drifting, hopefully not too far away. Well, they were over 100 miles away. They, they were able to get uh, the one man standing. They propped him up with the, the paddle. I called it the scarecrow in the middle of the sea because that's what one of the men on the uh, helm termed it. And they say if he had not been standing, they never would have seen the, the raft. But those four men were rescued. Unfortunately, two of them died the next day. So only two men of the 58 that were lashed together survived that ordeal. Was it nine days? Nine days, right. Without food uh, or water? Right, and practically no shelter in the in the sun at the, that near the equator. It's incredible that they survived, even those two. Now, down through the years, there have always been rumors, uh, and this has been the case in a number of shipwrecks and survivors on rafts and that sort of thing, that some of the crew may have, some of the men on the life rafts may have made it to an island or to Australia, but that has never been proven. There's no evidence to support that at all. I, I think it may be more wishful thinking. One would have thought they would have turned up somewhere along the line, wouldn't you? Or at least, yes, unless at least let the their families, for, unless they're on the run for some other reason, <laughs> right? Or at least let their let their families know they were okay. What happens to them when they get back? Is it hour and hour and redeployed? Yes, uh, they got shore leave uh, back in the states. A number of them went home. They still couldn't talk a lot. And by the way, there was, as you would suspect, a great deal of misinformation. Some heard that the uh, the Neosho had been adrift for two weeks and uh, that sort of thing. There was no mention of the men who were lost in the water. A lot of that was the Navy simply didn't want to confirm for the Japanese the, the damage that they had done to one of the few oilers we had in the Pacific at the time, by the way. Understand, this was very early in the war, only five months after Pearl Harbor. And we did not have a lot of oilers in the Pacific. Two had already been sunk. And a couple of them were back for refitting already. So the Neosho was, uh, she and a smaller tanker were the only two we had in the Coral Sea. So we didn't want to confirm for the Japanese how how damaging that uh, mis mistaken attack had been to, to the fleet. But yeah, most of them got back home. The ones who were still hospitalized, a, a couple of them had to remain hospitalized for a while for their, their wounds. The, the two men who did survive the raft both eventually got to go back home. And really one of the sad parts of the story, many years later, the nephew of one of the survivors of the Neosho was putting together some information about his uncle. And he contacted one of the two men who had survived those nine days on the raft and the gentleman was uh, very eager to help. He wanted the story to be told. He supplied the, uh, the nephew or the other crew member with uh, a lot of uh, information that he had collected down through the years, newspaper clippings and notes, images, including a picture that was taken from the helm of the four men being rescued from the raft. He sent those to the nephew and... Uh, a few months later, the nephew called him back and wanted to ask him some more questions about the ordeal, and that survivor refused to say anything else about it. 
He said since their first conversation, he had had nothing but nightmares, and it had brought back all the bad thoughts that he had managed to suppress all those years, so he would appreciate no more phone calls. Uh, that's heartbreaking. There must have been uh, millions of people after the war, literally, who were suffering. In writing all these books about World War II, I encounter that a lot. I, I get emails almost weekly from family members who say, now I know what my dad or my grandfather went through. He would never talk about it. He would never tell us. He would talk about getting drunk at a bar in Pearl Harbor or talk about uh, shore leave in uh, Sydney, King's Cross, but he would never tell us what happened during the war. So Oscar uh, Peterson won a Medal of Honor, Medal of Honor recipient. Yes, he was a water tender. That means he was in charge. He was basically a plumber taking care of the steam pipes. And when a bomb exploded in the engine room, it tore loose uh, a number of the steam pipes. And it was literally cooking uh, men to death. Oscar Peterson assumed it was his job to close the valves that was providing that steam. He climbed through a, a trunk in the seat in, in the, uh, the top of uh, that compartment, even though he had been badly burned already. Everything he touched was over 200 degrees um, Fahrenheit. He was literally burning his own hands and knees and arms and face as he crawled through steam and managed to shut off the valves that was causing so much damage and so much pain and uh, to, to the his, his crew mates. At the same time, there was still some hope that if he could get those valves shut off, they might be able to repair the steam leaks and get back under power. But uh, he actually survived for four days, but eventually passed away, and he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. I wouldn't have any Medal of Honor recipients, and not necessarily, he's, he's very much not front line. Exactly. And that's why I dedicate the book. I, I don't know if you recall the dedication. It's to the yeomen, stewards, machinists, cooks, water tenders, radiomen, pharmacists, mates, storekeepers, firemen, enginemen, ship fitters, seamen, electricians, mates, and all the other sailors who helped turn the tide of the sea in the World War II. Uh, and I mean it very sincerely. They're, they're called snipes, the guys who work below decks and do all the dirty work. And there's a, a poem called The Snipes Lament that I also quote from in the book. The, the author is unknown, but it's sort of a, a peon to the, the guys who do all the hard work. Not to take anything away from the officers or guys who have other jobs on the ship, but theirs is so important, especially on a ship like the Neo Show, which, by the way, sounds Japanese, but it's not. It's an American Indian name for a river in the, the states of Kansas and Missouri. After the whole thing, Captain Phillips made some recommendations in his action reports. Yes, very specific. He, he sketched these out as soon as he was aboard the Henley. The first thing he did was go to a, a stateroom he was assigned and started writing down these recommendations. And he also made copious notes because he knew any time a vessel of this importance and this size and with this loss of life uh, was lost, there would be a great deal of inquiry. And he wanted to make sure he had his thoughts together. But the first recommendation was do not give any command that can be misunderstood when it comes to abandoning ship. Make sure that you are saying remain at your battle station and separate that completely from any mention of abandoning ship. And that is common practice in the, the, at least the U.S. Navy to today. The other recommendation of great, well, several others, one was that life rafts be of a different color. They can still be something that can't be seen. They don't have to be real brightly colored, but they need to be some other color besides the water in which they're going to have to float. And he also recommended that the uh, life rafts, even on a ship like the Neosho, have some sort of uh, supplies, at least a, a cache of water, that they have something that can be rigged as a sail. They had no way to, to propel the vessel because, as mentioned, they, they were completely overloaded with men and a couple of boat paddles in a, in a, in a raft like that is not going to be able to, to move against a current or even help it to ride with the current if the current's going in the right direction. But to equip them with something where they could actually create some sort of sail and be able to sail it. And these recommendations are actually enacted on? Yes, they are. They've, they've been enacted. At least something good came out of it and probably saved lives over the years. Yes. And, you know, if, if we're talking about good coming out of it, 
I maintain, and some other people who are far better historians than I am maintain that because the Japanese sent a huge complement of their aircraft 250 miles south to attack what they believed to be an aircraft carrier that turned out to be a blue collar tanker. And they were not able to respond to the attack on the Port Moresby invasion force by uh, Task Force 17, that that evened the playing field a great deal when the next day the actual Battle of the Coral Sea took place. That was the first naval battle in which neither side's vessels saw each other. It was completely our aircraft against your aircraft many miles apart. There's argument to this day as to whether the U.S. or the Allies or the uh, the Japanese won that battle. It's generally considered to be a draw. And even though the U.S. lost one carrier, which sank, the Japanese had both their carriers damaged, and those carriers and their complement of aircraft were not available for the Battle of Midway, which was one month later. The Battle of Midway was our first real victory, the Allied sea victory over the Japanese in World War II. So that mistaken sighting of uh, Neosho, mistaken for an aircraft carrier, the fact that most of the Japanese attack bombers were uh, descending upon uh, the, the, the oiler at a time when they could have done far more damage to our carrier fleet farther north, played an important part in the, uh, that crucial turn in the, the war. That was the first time the, the movement south had been stopped uh, by the, the Japanese had been stopped by the Allies. And if they could have gone on, established Port Moresby and a couple of other bases they were aiming for, Australia would have been in severe danger. Yeah. How did you piece together the story? A, uh, a lot of it, uh, researching the Battle of the Coral Sea itself, although not much has been written about Neosho and the, uh, the role that she played, a tremendous help was a gentleman named Del Lu. Del was the nephew of Bill Lu. Bill was a crew member on Neosho who survived uh, the whole thing. And Dell had been collecting information about the Neosho and about the Sims and about what happened. He had done a number of interviews with survivors, uh, which is crucial. We're losing so many of our World War II veterans. We have to get them to talk. We have to get them to give us descriptions of that eyewitness history. Well, Dell did that simply because of his uncle and uh, his admiration for him and his bravery. That was a tremendous help in piecing this story together. Had he not contacted that one, uh, one of the two survivors from the raft, we would have no idea what went on uh, with those men because nobody else had heard the story and, until uh, the survivor told it to Del Lu, and he posted it on his website. Are there any survivors left? Are they left alive or have they all passed away? I only know of one. And he actually left the uh, Neosho before the Battle of the Coral Sea. But he was able to give me some good information on the ship under construction, the drills they ran as they prepared, how they were constantly being hurried even before the war to make those runs up and down the West Coast. And then from uh, San Pedro, which is a, a harbor uh, facility in Los Angeles, out to Pearl Harbor after the uh, the naval headquarters were moved to Pearl Harbor. So that was the only survivor of the ship at all that I was able to, to locate. But you have to remember that there were only 125 total. Which really leads me to your uh, website, untillmillions.net. With today's self-publishing technology, it's possible for anyone to capture oral history in a written form from anybody, whether it's a World War II veteran, someone who lived through America's Great Depression or the space program or uh, any, any person who was an eyewitness to historical events, you can write that down, type it up into a Word document and publish it on Amazon.com as both an ebook and an actual printed book if you want to. You're required by Amazon because they want to make a little money on this thing to put a price on it, but you can make it an extremely low price if you want to. And for that reason, Amazon is obligated to keep that information there. And as a researcher or a writer or a historian, we would all have access to it from now on. 
that's one way to do it. Of course, there are a lot of other fine programs, I'm sure, in uh, Great Britain and other parts of the world. But here in America, well, Amazon's are, all pervasive. <laughs> yes. And that and it's so simple to do, too, without having to go through any sort of formal process. But a number of academic institutions, uh, the government here, the Smithsonian Institute, uh, people like that also have programs for collecting oral history. They're just a lot more structured than uh, this thing is. But anyway, on the uh, the website, untoldmillions.net, I tell people how you can do that. And uh, I, I hope more people will. It's just critically important that we capture people who were eyewitnesses to history, capture their impressions, what they saw. It's not always accurate. It's not always exactly the way it happened. Uh, some some people tend to forget, and after 60 or 70 years, I understand. But uh, it's still valuable. It is. It's very valuable. And it is funny how it is. You know, my father was 18 in 1944 when he was drafted. He would, if he was still alive, would be in his late 80s now. They really are um, now dying dying off thick and fast and that and that is going and th- and how many people do you talk to that, oh, i wish i'd just talked to x y and z about this that and the other of, of of their war yes and it's important to remember it's not just uh the huge things it's the little things what was like life like on an oiler in the pacific in world war ii what was your day like what sort of duty did you have what did you eat how'd you keep your clothes clean what, what was what was it like that that's crucial, especially to people like me who like to tell the human side of history. <laughs> one of the one of the strangest things that I asked my father about. I said, "Well, when the war finished, where were you? What 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 did you do? Because you you know you see the speeches on the TV, you see you know people kissing in the streets and having a party. You went, oh, I've, I've, I don't know. I said, "What do you mean? You must have know. Oh, we just got told the war had finished for us. It was just another day. <laughs> yeah, we just wanted to get home. <laughs> well, Don, thank you for joining me. Don's book, The Ship That Wouldn't Die, A World War II Story of Courage and Survival at Sea, is available now. I've put the link on the website, www.podcast.com. You can find Don at donkeith.com. There, you'll find the full list of his published books. If you're interested in submarines, I strongly suggest you take a look. That's all for this show. Don't forget, if you want to get in touch, have a look at the website, www.podcast.com, or you can find me on Facebook. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.